Now, I know some of you are at baseball, or you have practice, or you have work, but still, uh, those of you who could have been here and you weren't here, that really annoys me. I know who was here and who wasn't. And where were you? Not here. Let's go. And if you were not here last night, I'm very annoyed at you, and I will ask you, because I know who wasn't here. And that makes me mad, because I'm giving up my time to help you with this. And so, because I'm giving up my time, I get a little bit mad, unless you, unless you can't, unless there's something major coming up. I expect you to be here tomorrow at 6.30. I know you have things, but I expect you to be here. Take advantage of that. What? I don't know, and you were not here, that's but so as long as you tell me that's fine, but then I get I get annoyed and I know. Okay, moving on. I will be here at lunch. I will not answer questions, but I will stare at anybody who reviews. So I'll give it my best evil stare. We'll work on it. I'll work on that. Just look at Taylor, you'll just get the most upset. Yeah, I can't do that. Disgusted look. Maybe near the end, but I can try to avoid that. And then somebody's going to charge. All right. So let's go ahead then and finish up. I'm going to go through a lot of stuff today of the 1960s. We're going to move very fast. So we went to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We started this. On Friday, and just to review, what did the United States decide to do when they realized that the missile crisis, or that the Soviets had missiles then? They, they can't call the blockade, they called it a what? Yeah, quarantine. And on the 24th, that's when the first ships came and it nearly went to war. And over the next four days, there was no direct communication between the Kremlin, Kremlin and the White House. So there's this very haphazard series of communications by radio broadcasts and a number of things. And after the test, I'll tell you, on one day, the 26th, four times, we nearly ended the world. And I'll tell you those are going to blow you away. But on October 28th, an agreement was finally made. And the agreement had three basic parts. In public, the U.S. said they wouldn't invade and the Soviets removed the missiles. But secretly, the United States said they would do something they were already going to do. But they didn't want to look like blackmail. All those medium and intermediate range missiles they had in Italy and Turkey, they're going to remove. They were obsolete. They were liquid fuel. They're going to take them out anyways. But they said, we won't do this unless it's secret. The U.S. had, in fact, Kennedy called them his ace, his ace in the hole. The first 100 Minute Man one missiles had just been put out in around Great Falls. Didn't need those missiles in Italy and Turkey anymore. And Kennedy is going to be bitterly criticized by more conservatives who were cold warriors and said, how dare you not try to destroy Castro? even though they would continue mongoose. But the United States would keep a, an embargo on Cuba till this very day. It's just a couple months ago that uh, Obama began to lessen the embargo a little bit, but it's still basically there. Yeah. Okay, so he would remove the missiles from Turkey and Italy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Couple outcomes of this. First off, they were so close to nuclear war that both sides agreed to a limited test ban agreement. Ending open open atmospheric tests. They still did underground tests in the eighties, and then they also set up a hotline, a direct line. Everyone thought it was a phone. You've seen in movies, it's a phone. It's actually a telegraph line for twenty years, but a direct communication between the White House and the Kremlin. So the President of the U.S. and the Premier of the Soviet Union could talk. Great, good cartoon, Khrushchev and Kennedy. And so the realization hit how close it was. And yes, Kennedy's popularity did go up slightly during this because he stood down the Soviets. But in the Soviet Union, Khrushchev would be humiliated. It looked like he backed down. And in 64, he was ousted. They didn't execute him. They just kind of put him in exile. And his dot, dot check never was allowed to leave. And it's actually Brezhnev, Leonid Brezhnev, 
a guy named Alexander Kosygin, but Brezhnev became the new chairman of the Soviet Union of, of the Communist Party. He was an old Stalinist uh, veteran from the 19, early, late 1930s and World War II. When I was a kid, Brezhnev was the face of the Soviet Union. That big, unsmiling, frowning face with massive eyebrows. And then him and all these old, old generals would watch these parades of Soviet weapons kind of waving, chest full of a thousand medals. But what happened with Brezhnev is this. Brezhnev and the new Polar Girl said, never again are we going to be humiliated. And the Soviet Union went an all-out effort to build nuclear weapons as fast as they could do. As fast as they could build them. So this is one, I believe this is a satin, one of their ICBM missiles that could carry a 50 megaton nuclear bomb. Never again are they going to be humiliated. Now, this is going to have a few impacts, but the biggest one is it destroyed the Soviet economy. It destroyed the Soviet economy. Yes. He actually win all those medals and they just put medals He was awarded them. But the communists gave, actually, before he became, but they gave themselves, you know, they gave all the leaders of the Communist Party all these medals. So they all had these huge chests of medals. The Soviets would end up spending over 50% of their entire economy, their GDP, on weapons. Massively building missiles and nuclear weapons to match the, so or the United States. And by the late 70s, their economy was in shambles, in free fall. They, they, had to, they used to be the breadbasket of Europe, now they had to import grain from the United States. Their economy, in fact, the sign of the Soviet Union, for the average person was waiting in line for basic necessities like eating for bread, waiting in line for hours to get the basic necessities. They destroyed their economy. By the late 1970s, the Soviet economy was in free fall. Why didn't they help their economy? They were funneling so much money. When they funnel so much money in defense, it's money that doesn't go to any place else. And so so there wasn't any money and so it didn't do anything for or even that. Sure, but they didn't have consumer goods. And they didn't really pay them very well either because they spent so much. So they, they couldn't build any of the consumer goods, any of the transportation things they needed. All the money went into that. And when you build a missile, it doesn't do anything else. Yeah, and strategic weapons. These are weapons designed to hit the US and big cities in Europe. Look how many the Soviets have. Just strategic nuclear weapons. They peaked at 40,000, and they'd have almost the same number of tactical weapons to be used on the battlefield. The U.S., to be combined with Britain and France, who had nuclear weapons, had over, their peak was at 35,000, and they had another 30,000 tactical nuclear weapons. By the mid-1970s, both sides had enough weapons to destroy the world over 100 times each. And I don't mean just like destroy it, like, oh, civilization is gone, but there's you know, like the bad post-apocalyptic movie. No, I mean gone. Nothing alive. It became insanity. But nobody could back down. The Soviets and food were tough. And no American politician could significantly reduce these because they didn't want to look soft on communism. Yeah. What I mean, what was the idea with a tactical nuclear weapon? Battle Yeah, but I mean and he makes a breakthrough, use a nuclear weapon to solve it. Yeah. Oh, I know. I mean, it's, it's insanity. And it's falling. Because think of all the money that's going to go into this. And one more thing. Write down MAD. That became basically the acronym for the policy of both sides. Mutually Assured Destruction. <laughs> Mutually assured destruction. Both sides basically, they're, now their tactic was, we're not going to have nuclear war because if one side starts, if the other side will fire, the world stop. Nobody wins. Frightening world. In the late 1970s, a new group of conservatives will come in and they'll say, hey, we can win a nuclear war. Then it gets scary. So, while this is going on, the civil rights movement continued, 
And I mentioned this when I talked about, or when we watched the Rage of Event. There was a civil rights bill passed in 57, but it did virtually nothing. The big thing was finally a bill was passed. And so there was a push to end Jim Crow. Martin Luther King's group was the Southern Christian Leadership Council, the SCLC, closely tied with the NAACP. And what they wanted to do was very active civil disobedience. Remember, this is a morality play to show good versus evil. And what they got is young, very brave volunteers, mostly black, but a lot of whites too. Young men and women would go into segregated restaurants and other establishments and sit there and demand to be served. And they would not leave till they're served. This is at a Woolworths in North Carolina, and this is one of the first ones. And that counter, where they show angry whites dumping their pop on them or food or ketchup and mustard on the protesters, that counter is at the Smithsonian Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. It is now preserved. The town, the, sh the store is called Woolworths. Does anyone ever? Yeah. Couple people. Now, Woolworths used to be a big, they called them five and dime stores. Yeah. So it was the counter, like, still like kind of barrier, just like, do they clean it? It's clean, yeah. Okay. yeah. But they just preserved it. Because the Woolworths stayed in business for years. So. Oh, okay. And so when the Woolworths shut down, the company lost one of bulk, essentially, in the late 80s, when they left. out. So they were gone. But here they are being attacked, being yelled at, intimidated, and the point is, morale be blind. Who stands for justice here? Here's a better way to look at it. If you're thinking about what you want the United States to be, what do you want the United States to be? Like these people or like these people? No, we're not all going to be perfect, but what do you want? They're going to force people to act. Kennedy has promised civil rights, but nothing has happened. Congress is doing nothing. They're going to make them act. Another one is called the Freedom Riders. And they're going to ride to the South challenging interstate bus segregation. Two big groups, CORE and SNCC. 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 Congress of Racial Equality, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They would soon become pretty violent, but that's another story. SNCC and CORE. Closely allied at first to the SCLC, but eventually both groups would think Martin Luther King's not moving fast enough. And they would eventually break away. What they thought they would do is ride through the South, go into, in, on integrated buses, and go to bus depots that were segregated and both black and white going together. And they are risking life and limb because they know they're going to be attacked, and the police and the state police are either going to watch and do nothing or even join in. And the area where there's going to be the most, a little bit in South Carolina, Jackson, Mississippi, they're all going to be arrested and held for a while. But in Birmingham and Montgomery, they're going to be attacked the most brutally. Here they are right before they got to Birmingham. And when they got to Birmingham, the state police stopped them, and then a couple of the buses were firebombed. There's one of the buses. And when they came out, they, were, they, were, they attempted to arrest them for causing a riot. And in the process, the police beat the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, basically a Molotov cocktail, you know, gasoline bomb. And pulling a broken tooth out, you know, they just beat the heck out of him. This is a man by the name of John Lewis. He was one of the leaders of the Corps, and he would be beaten a number of times, barely make it out of his life. Do you see his right jaw? Do you notice how it's kind of sunk in? It was shattered with a nice thing. He has a shattered jaw right there. He still talks a little bit funny. He's now in the 70s, he just can't enunciate this clearly. But he still is a leader. He is a member of the US Congress from, from Georgia today. Still in Congress. An amazing man. He still has this awful kind of dented scar from this. And the point is, once again, what side do you want to be on? What side? But here's the thing. The new frontier failed. Civil rights was failing. Things were not passing. By the summer of 63, Kennedy's approval rate was plummeting. He was, okay, personally, he was very popular. But his job approval rating was very low. 
because more than anything else, the frustration over his failures, especially civil rights. Either he was not getting a pass, or people who are more racist were saying, you're allowing these people to protest. They should be happy with what they got. And so, this would trigger a major, major, it was going to be a rally to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. It's going to be a combination of the SCLC and CORE, NAACP, and then the money came from labor unions, especially the United Auto Workers. That's where the money came from. This. And this was going to be a March on Washington, yes, 1963. And Kennedy did not want it. Kennedy begged everybody involved, the head of the UAW, Walter Ruther, he begged him not to do it. He begged Martin Luther King not to do it. But King made it clear, no, we have to do this. And think about it, this is a time before the internet, half the people there didn't have phones, and still 100,000 people came to the mall in Washington, D.C. And there were 13 major speeches. Martin Luther King gave the most famous one, we're in it, he made it very clear. We need more than just civil rights. King also made it clear in this speech, and get this down somewhere, economic equality. We need more than just laws. We need jobs. The poverty rate amongst blacks is 50%. How can we ever be free if we have no economic freedom? We need help for the impoverished. That's why the United Auto Workers is so much involved in this. Part of the reason why conservatives hated labor unions. And that speech would also end with, its, he, he did this, it's kind of a shtick he would do at the end of the speeches. It's a great shtick, I'm jealous of it. Where he said, the I have a dream part. But he made it very clear that this is going to be a fight. Good speech. Kennedy actually hated it because it made him look weak. Kennedy, therefore, had to find something to make him look strong. None of nothing passed. He looked strong after the Cuban Missile Crisis. What made him look strong? South Vietnam. Kennedy inherited Eisenhower's help for the South Vietnam, and Kennedy escalated. Kennedy would send thousands more advisors. There were less than a thousand advisors. Those are U.S. military personnel. Training South Vietnam. When Kennedy was assassinated, there were nearly 18,000. There were hundreds of American casualties by then. Americans were actually involved in missions, either flying helicopters carrying South Vietnamese troops or sometimes even bombing. And in secret, U.S. Navy ships were off the coast of Vietnam shelling. So the United States was involved. That is a, an American Green Beret Special Forces member as an advisor. Kennedy increased it for these reasons. Oh, the domino theory. We don't know if Kennedy really believed the domino theory, but everybody talked about it. But then Berlin. Kennedy was worried that if he wasn't strong in South Vietnam, he would look weak in Berlin, and the NATO might fall apart. He also believed he'll never get any of the civil rights bill or any other new frontier bill passed if they come up to him and say, you lost South Vietnam. But then he wanted to be reelected. And he knew that if he had Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam all the time, he wouldn't be reelected. There's a myth going around that started almost immediately after the US got involved full scale in 1965 in South Vietnam, that Kennedy would not have got the United States into this. Maybe, you know, we don't know if he was assassinated. But, there's absolutely no evidence. It's hard to even imagine. The last speech Kennedy gave, the biggest thing he bragged about were increased event spending in South Vietnam. The government's still there. The last speech he was going to give was mainly about South Vietnam as holding or winning against communism. It would have been a big retreat to get out of Vietnam. That is the president. You remember him? Nguyen Sam. I was taking a walk the other day. I was walking. You have a ton of exciting, huh? 
Where in Helena? Huh? Where in Helena? Uh, the town. <laughs> and I saw that's a South Vietnamese flag, and I saw a, a South Vietnamese flag bumper sticker on the car. I've seen a couple of those where people were veterans of the Vietnam yeah. War, but it was just the flag and nothing else. Just the flag bumper sticker. Whoa. And I walked past, and then I thought, why didn't I take a picture of that? Why would you do that? Huh? Why would you I thought because I've never seen a flag like that, a bumper sticker like that. Talk about, you know, the legacy of the war and get special topics, especially, but I didn't. That's what we call a good story that has not really been. <laughs> So, Zambia's government was very corrupt. Very, very corrupt. He was Catholic and the Buddhist majority hated him. Almost all the leading government posts and uh, government posts with family members. The government was a kleptocracy. A kleptocracy means a government that does what? Kleptocracy? Yeah, they make money by stealing from the people. There's a lot of kleptocracies in this world. Anybody know the biggest kleptocracy? China. Uh, North Korea, you could almost say it is, but there's something else that's even more sinister. Russia's kleptocracy. A complete, total kleptocracy. Now, I'm saying that Putin is probably listening. He's always listening. <laughs> and the thing was, by the summer of 63, even though Kennedy's saying we're winning, they're losing. It really was a thought. Talk in the White House. When's the South Vietnamese government just going to collapse? We're pumping millions of dollars in. All these advisors, Americans are dying, and we're going to lose. How can we keep this thing going to the election? And that is when the South Vietnamese army, a couple of the generals came up and said, he's destroying the country. Oh, almost forgot one other thing. There were these street protests that began in the summer of 63. And they would always focus on a dramatic conclusion. And these would become some of the most famous pictures of the Vietnam War. Buddhist monks lighting themselves on fire in protest to the Zen regime. And these are people who are anti-communist. And this, well, let's put it this way. If you have Buddhist monks burning themselves alive in the streets of Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, that doesn't look like victory. That looks like defeat. And if you ask people who were alive during the 1960s, what images do you remember the Vietnam War? That's one. Kennedy looks back, and all of a sudden these generals go to the CIA and the US ambassador in Vietnam and say, we want to get rid of them. And they say, do it. And so in October of 1963, there's a coup against them. Zem is killed, though. Which actually really shook Kennedy up. Because Kennedy had a pipe dream once he signed off on this that the Vietnamese army, the South Vietnamese army is not going to kill him. Of course they're going to kill him. When they captured him, they beat him senseless and then executed him and most of his family members. There's no doubt they're going to kill him. Now, you don't need to write down this name. That is uh, Nawat Min. I would call them big men. But what happened after Zen was killed? would be military dictatorships. That's what we got to get. Military dictatorship after military dictatorship after military dictatorship. There were like three coups in a year. Military dictatorship. And the problem was now, once the U.S. signed up on the killing of them, the United States now is committed to dictatorships. U.S. has no choice. We must support these awful dictatorships. And every one of those dictatorships, the U.S. would say, they are the equivalent of what man? George Washington, and democracy is on the march in South Vietnam. No. We're stuck with him. Because if we turn around and say, we don't support him, what's going to happen to the South Vietnamese government? It will collapse, and the National Liberation Front will win. And the president will be blamed for losing South Vietnam. Now, you just asked a logical question. Why should we support him? These dictators that nobody likes. Because Kennedy wanted to get reelected. Here's what we got to get domestic politics. Domestic politics said we got to support them. So, Taylor brought up a very logical point. 
unpopular military dictators will never last. It's doomed. It's doomed. But because of domestic politics, nobody wanted to. Nobody wanted to. Civil rights going on. All these other programs. Thing is, we don't know what Kennedy would have done. Why? A month after Zem died. Some people thought it's connected, but almost certainly it wasn't. Lee Harvey Oswald in Dallas, Texas, assassinated John Kennedy. November 22nd, 1963. Kennedy's assassinated. November 20, no, sorry, November 21st, 1963. Kennedy is assassinated. Friday, Dallas, Texas, the Lee Plaza. And Lee Harvey Oswald would be captured. There, despite what people have said, there was overwhelming evidence that, that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald did it. In fact, there is the, the, the weapon. He's holding a communist newspaper. It's about communists, his wife, who was from Russia. Took the picture, but it's crazy. She admits taking the picture. And he tried to defect the Soviet Union. He'd go there for a year and a half. He uh, didn't try to defect Cuba. They didn't take it. Well, they let it's complex. Sorry about these. But they finally let him in, but they didn't let him defect. Yes. Well, let's get to it. Now, the evidence was overwhelming. They found that he ordered the rifle. They had all this evidence. I mean, some of it circumstantial, some very convincing. But then, and he also, with eight witnesses, saw him shoot a police officer while trying to escape about an hour later. And that's kind of how they started to catch him. There's a lot of stuff going on. I can't go into detail right now. Special topics we went through pretty careful. But then, two days after the assassination, a strip club owner by the name of Jack Ruby assassinated Oswald. In fact, it was on national television. He reached out and shot Oswald that is being escorted to the basement garage of the Dallas police station, which is just crazy. The reporters and various people. They were going to take him to the county jail that was more secure. He screamed out, you killed my president, you rat. He thought, Ruby thought he'd be a hero because he killed the assassin. He would actually die in prison of pancreatic cancer four years after the assassination. But that's why people, that seems weird. Like somebody's trying to silence the assassin. Now, first, many people believe, including the new president, Lyndon Johnson, that Kennedy's assassination was the precursor to an all-out Soviet attack. I mean, they, they got the heck out of Dallas, and they wanted to get Air Force One in the air, just in case. They were convinced, because that's what they believed, there'd be all these guerrilla attacks, and then World War III. They believed this. Looking back, it was crazy, but they believed it. And then some people thought after the United States got involved in Vietnam and things about the CIA and Operation Mongoose started coming out, then people believed it might have been the CIA or the FBI or maybe even organized crime. And there was some vast conspiracy. Now, to show that the Soviets weren't involved, because they were worried about World War III, Johnson would have the Warren Commission. He kind of coerced Chief Justice Earl Warren to be the head of it. A nine member bipartisan commission to look at the assassination. But in reality, they had nothing to do with it. There they are handing the summarized version of the Warren Report. It's 12 volumes. No one's ever actually read the thousands of pages. I have a summary of it. I've actually read it. Parts are really, really well done. But the FBI and the CIA kept most of their investigation secret. They were watching Oswald. What a screw up. Yeah. They were watching Oswald and Oswald shot the president. The FBI had a vested interest to keep it secret. So they, we don't know. At first, they didn't know a lot of what the FBI did. Right. The FBI. Yeah. Right. They, they just covered it up. They didn't invest, they didn't do anything that people should have known because then that would imply they all the way to the top. So they just covered up money. Keep it simple. And they ruled that it was Oswald acting alone and Ruby acting alone. And there were some mistakes in the Warren report because of information they didn't know, but basically there, there's never been evidence well, that said anything else. There's been 
conjecture and people have said and weird things, but there's never been evidence. But by the end of the decade, about 60% of the population believe there is conspiracy. And today, it's about 80%. It's about 80% of the American population believe there is conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. Most people don't know anything about it, but you know, they believe there's a conspiracy. Now, I, of course, believe there was a conspiracy too, and it involved aliens and the reanimated brain of Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and I say, some of you are thinking, well, that doesn't sound logical. Well, I got one thing to say prove me wrong. I also insist that the sky is flat. <laughs> prove me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> One in my call. All right, so the new president, Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson came in with a ball of energy. An absolute ball of energy. LBJ, a Texan. And there's never been a president like Lyndon Johnson. He is arguably one of the greatest American presidents. I don't mean great as in like everything he did is, is good. I just mean great as there's never been anybody like him. He was an omnipresent president. He was involved in everything. And what he decided to do as soon as he began being president, Kennedy couldn't get his bills passed. I will get every single one of Kennedy's bills passed. I'll do whatever it takes. And I'll get more. I will finish the New Deal. Has everyone got that? He's going to out Kennedy, Kennedy, and he's going to out FDR, FDR. And he would, in a lot of ways. His program would be called the Great Society. And it was an all-encompassing program to make the United States a better place. He announced it at the commencement address at the University of Michigan in May of 1964. And this was his fate. Everything was Great Society. He got 1,500 laws passed in the Great Society. We're talking law after law after law. Nobody got more laws passed than Lyndon Johnson. His first couple of years, it was awesome. I mean, just like, no one's ever been like this. He knew how to get things done. I'm not saying the laws were good. What Johnson figured is this. I have a limited amount of time. I'm going to get everything passed. And if there's problems with it, I'll go back later and fix it. Now that sounds good, but what if you don't get that opportunity? What if you screwed up by, let's say, getting involved in the land war nation? Here's the deal, though. How is Johnson ever going to get these bills passed if you have Vietnam? We're losing in Vietnam. Vietnam is falling. Now, that's what you have to get. How is he going to get it passed? If they're jamming Vietnam up his, he said it. You got to hide it. You got to hide Vietnam. Make it look like he's winning. As he said, if you have a mother in law with three eyeballs and one's in the middle of her forehead, you don't keep her in the living room. Did he say that? <laughs> right? Would you keep her in the living room? No, you hide her. Johnson had a lot of very earthy comments. I'll tell you about the boot a little bit later on. Yes. Do you think he was like an expert horseman or something? Nah, so he's just a Texan. So incorrect. He's a Texan, so he's supposed to be on a horse. He had a ranch. He had an ego issue. Anyone want to guess the name of his ranch? The LBJ Ranch. His wife was Lady Bird Johnson. Daughters, Lucy Bain Johnson, Linda Bird Johnson. Do you catch something? <laughs> He had two TVs. He had a TV station and a radio station, WLBJ. Are you catching a trend here? Yes. What is like? What are you some of these students about that? Jake's if it's a keynote on that was probably the last time you ever. I'll tell you. I'll show you exactly what it is. I'll show you how he did it. It's your life. You. So it was three prong. The first prong, civil rights. He's going to get it done. Now I got to be clear about. It. He's pushed. Who did it were the brave men and women of the freedom rights, of the civics, of the boycott. They're the ones who got it done. 
But there are two laws we had to get. <coughs> huh? <coughs> so you came late, you leave early. Where are you going? Tickets for what? Prom's made up. Who's ever heard of a prom before? <laughs> Sit down and be quiet, punk. <laughs> All right, so civil rights. Two big civil rights bills will be passed. And I'll come back to the civil rights bill in just a second, but the civil rights act of 64. The most important, well, they're both. They're so important, it's hard to put into context. The civil rights act of 64. Johnson got passed. And it says no discrimination based upon race. It also has ethnic background, religious belief, but I put down race and one more word. Do you catch it? It should be easy. I capitalized it. It says sex. And what it meant is this. There can be no discrimination, legal discrimination against women. This was put into the bill as a poison pill by conservatives hoping to scuttle the civil rights bill. But a lot of liberal Democrats wanted equal rights for women. And other people who voted for this, liberal Democrats and liberal Republicans, were like, no woman actually really wants to be treated equal, so who cares? It's just a throwaway line. But it passed. This is why it's such an important bill. Not only does it guarantee equal rights, for all people, regardless of color, literally it is for all people. Not all. There are other, there are some things that people can still be discriminated against legally in the United States, and women do not have equal rights under the Constitution today. Under the law, yes, but laws can be changed. But there are groups that can still be discriminated against. The best known are homosexuals. In Montana, someone could be fired from their job because of homosexuals. That's cause. And so that still can happen in some states. Some states can. Every state has different rules on that. But the point is this path. There was a 60 day filibuster. 60 days. And Johnson said, I will keep the Senate open all summer. Nothing else except this filibuster. And after 60 days, they broke it. And it passed. And then in 65, the Voting Rights Act. The voting, not oh, the voting rights, not the voting rights, <laughs> just one right. The Voting Rights Act said it set up a system where the federal government will assure that people are going to be registered to vote and to not, not deny the right to vote. And this is one of the most important bills in American history. But you notice in 65, I will come back to this because it ties in very much with the Vietnam War. And when Johnson gave a speech on national television, pushed by a march called Selma to Montgomery, which I'll tell you about tomorrow, when Johnson gave the speech, Johnson walked off and said, I think I've just destroyed the Democratic Party for the next 40 years. Because this will blow up the old Democratic Party. And Southern whites, and white men, especially all over the country, would begin to leave the party over this issue. The other part was the war on poverty. And the war on poverty was going to be a program to reduce the incredibly high rates of poverty, especially in certain areas. The poverty rates among African Americans, as I said before, is at 50%. The overall poverty rate was about 25%. Poverty, when it was Poverty pretty low, far. That's in Appalachia. And what they passed is law after law after law. They expanded food stamps. They expanded aid for families. They expanded job training. Head Start is one of their most famous ones, and this would provide what? Do you want to know? Anyone know what Head Start is? Yeah, it's basically preschool for people at or just above the poverty line. In some ways, a very successful program. But the problem is this, the war on poverty is always going to be hampered by two different views. Is it the problem of poverty is the simple fact that people don't have money, the very logical economic fact. People are poor because they don't have money. And they act weird and act do irrational things because they don't have money. Or are they poor because of some social failing? Which is it? 
Oh, by the way, if they're poor because of something wrong with them, what do we call that? Philosophy. Is it social Darwinism or is it an economic problem? Which is it? I can tell you what I think. But they couldn't decide, so they tried to do both. And by doing both, they failed. Yes, the poverty rate was cut by almost 70% in 15 years. The poverty rate went below 10% by the mid-1970s. But then through various things, but the big thing is cutting back on the programs as more conservative social Darwinists came in, what happened to the poverty rate? It began to go up, and now the poverty rate is, the poverty rate's about 17.5% in the United States, which is the highest it's been since the 60s. But you know what the poverty rate of, of minors, of people below 18 is? It's nearly 30%. The highest in the industrialized world. Okay, that's my big pet peeve. Everyone talks about ways to improve schools. We have this stuff like Common Core, which is wonderful. I'm talking to my camera. Okay, I don't like it. But, What's the big issue? They can go into a school. All you need is a zip code of a school, and they can pretty much tell you their test scores. Why? Poor zip codes, low. The higher the wealth in the area, the higher the test scores. It's actually remarkable. It's accurate to within about 98%. So what do we do? The teachers in jail. And I'm with you. I'm all for jailing teachers. Who's with me? Jail them all. Okay, I got one little problem with that, Michael. You were too enthusiastic about jailing teachers. Okay, I will be at lunch. I will answer any questions you have. I'll go over some more of the 80s. I will. I got to eat a bar. I'm hungry. The problem with doing this is I never have time to eat lunch. <coughs> no. Yeah, what? Okay, absolutely. Guidance, I want you to tell me I know who's gone. Yes. Yeah, you were at the movie theater. I did not see Alex yesterday. I did not see Christian yesterday. You were at work. Okay, what were you, Christian? I was at work. Yeah, really. Where are you working at? Okay. Who else didn't I see? I saw Michael. It's a crisp with 50 grams of protein. Have you had these? They're actually good. Normally, things with high protein taste like uh, cardboard. This tastes like relatively tasty cardboard. Oh, chili and candy. No one agrees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.